slide, Nikki. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to day two of Africa Family Business Research Conference. Thank you so much for joining us for this session this morning. We're joined by Dr. Tony Machavaho, who is head of Department of Business Management and the member of Nelson Mandela University's Family Business Unit. His keynote today is on ensuring the transgenerational potential and success of indigenous African family businesses. So thank you, Tony, Dr. Tony, over to you. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Nikkei, and uh, good, good morning to everybody who's here um, watching the presentation. Uh, as uh, Nikkei said, my pr presentation today will be on uh, indigenous African family businesses, um, specifically discussing um, improving the potential and success in these indigenous African family businesses. This is work that was uh, summarized from my PhD research. So um, I'll try and touch on all the relevant aspects, specifically where there were some interesting findings and, and then take it from there in terms of the question and answers. Uh, as was mentioned, as was mentioned yesterday, um, the importance of family in all the presentations yesterday, family businesses are very important globally. They're responsible for a large part of a gross domestic product, um, identified as key role players in uh, creation of employment, skills development, and general business activities within uh, the countries. In Africa specifically, they play a vital role in the economy and make a substantial contribution to the economic growth and stability. Uh, my research in particular focused on three Southern African countries, namely Botswana, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. That's where the three uh, family businesses uh, came from. So I'll just highlight a few things about family businesses in those areas. In Zimbabwe, 80% of businesses could be classified as family businesses, tend to be small and medium-sized. In Botswana, 75% of uh, the private sector employment uh, and 20% of the national output is as a, as, a, as a result of small to medium-sized family businesses. And the majority of the market cap of the JSC, as was mentioned yesterday, are held in the hands of family. But despite this, their importance and despite uh, the, clearly their impact and influence on the economy globally and uh, in the continent and in our various countries, the failure rate still is very high. And African businesses, family businesses are only expected to survive five to 10 years and don't normally make it to the next generation. So in Africa, these businesses tend to be less formal, uh, less institutionalized than in your developed economies and rarely pass on to the second generation owners. So given the fact that these businesses are so important and given the fact that currently the literature there is a very Anglo-centric understanding of family businesses, uh, very limited research has been published in the indigenous African context. Most of the research done has been published in uh, a European and American setting, uh, most notably with the, the successful transgenerational entrepreneurship practices project, the STEP project. And therefore, there's a greater need for deeper insights in, uh, and, it, and an increased understanding into the practices that are implemented by these indigenous African family businesses that have actually survived. So we need to, understand, we need to get, find, understand and get greater clarity on how businesses who have managed to survive, how are they make, making use of their unique familyness resource pools and capabilities? How are they entrepreneurially oriented? Uh, and what contextual factors have been interacting with them um, that they've been able to overcome to ensure their transgenerational potential? So the main purpose of this research, the research was uh, to explore and describe those factors that influence the transgenerational potential of indigenous African family businesses. In doing this research, we're taking existing models as well as um, to try and contextualize them for the African context, as well as to find African solutions or African understandings of these concepts and uh, to better explain what is happening uh, when these successful businesses. Just to, just to be clear, to highlight for everyone, what do we, when we talk about an indigenous African family business, this is a business in which the family is of indigenous African descent um, and owns more than 50% of the voting shares. The family is active in the management of the business and at, in the operations of at least one of the business activities. And I looked at businesses which where the second generation family members are now involved in the management of these businesses. 
So therefore, these businesses had to have the intention to pass it on to the next generation of family members. In terms of the scope and delimitation of the study, the study focused on three indigenous African family businesses located in South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Botswana, as I mentioned previously. Um, these businesses were selected uh, due to their close proximity to each other, due to similarities in history and culture to a certain extent. All of them are members of the Southern African development community, all use English uh, because of their British colonial backgrounds. And all three countries possess political, business, cultural, and social characteristics that can give us uh, deeper insights into what is dubbed the African context. So these real life findings will enable uh, the researcher and uh, to refine, develop, and improve theoretical underpinnings in the different contexts, and then expand those initial understandings given these real life cases. To get a bit of the research T's and C's out the way, and it, uh, qualitative approach was taken, interpretive paradigm, the multiple cases to allow us to make comparisons and get deeper understandings of the object of interest, namely indigenous African family business, businesses. And the main aim being allow us to make comparisons across these findings. Now, a bit of information about the businesses who participated in the study. There were three, uh, three businesses from three countries. We've uh, withheld the names for uh, ethics and privacy purposes. Uh, the South African business was in the fuel retail industry established in 1971, uh, family owned since 1975. The Zimbabwe family business is in the swimming pool construction industry established in 1966. And the Botswana family business in the construction and transport industry also established in 1977. So you can see from the years of these businesses that they've been around for a long time and they've been around through periods of uh, from independence in the various countries of freedom through um, also overlapping into the previous eras of apartheid and uh, colonialism. The participants of the study, uh, each business had four participants who uh, were interviewed as part of the study. Uh, in the South African business, the CEO was interviewed. He's a second generation uh, member of the family and the son of the founder. We had the, the wife who's the general manager also in the second generation. We had an employee, in other words, the daughter, who's actually been earmarked to be, take over the business as third generation. And we have a non-family member as the advisor, as the fourth participant. In the Zimbabwe business, the same situation. Second generation founder, uh, a wife of the founder, a brother, and a family friend. And in the Botswana family business, we had the son of the founder. We had the original founder, who's now retired as well as the cousin of the CEO, who's the financial manager and a non-family member as well. Interviewing these different people will be able to give us uh, deeper insights and be able to triangulate and get to what are some of the issues that are unique to the African family business, indigenous African family businesses and the context that they operate in. Now I'm going to differ a little bit from what you normally get and I'm actually gonna give you a spoiler and jump straight to what is uh, the picture or framework highlighting the results. And from these results, I'm going to unpack some of the key areas that are specific or unique or interesting to family, uh, indigenous African family businesses. This framework was originally is an ad adaptation of the STEP project framework, which after the research findings has been, ad has been adapted given uh, what we found in, our, in the research. If I can explain it just a quick little bit here. Outside here, we have our external factors or our contextual factors. Um, you'll see on the yellow here, we have Ubuntu, a collectivist national culture, community, and extended family commitments. Um, these all influenced how the business used its resources and how entrepreneurial the business was. And then specifically, the business environment and industry in which the business operated particularly influenced how entrepreneurial the business is. And you'll see under the resource pools, the different, these are the, the eight familyness resource pools have been adapted to um, display what is a better description for the African context. And from there, you have your transgenerational potential. How do we get to there? That's your performance, entrepreneurial performance outcomes leading to your financial performance outcomes, leading to your social performance outcomes. Now I'm going to touch on some of the key um, aspects of this model that where there were quite interesting uh, results in terms of your indigenous family businesses. 
indigenous African family businesses. Let's start with the resource pools. And the first aspect is looking at your financial capital. Now, all three businesses in, uh, that were part of the study financed initial, the initial startup uh, and financed their businesses using uh, debt, but through loans from the government or entities or individuals. However, it was key and it was evident that all three businesses are generally very risk averse when it comes to making use of debt financing. Um, they're less likely to make use of debt than non-family businesses due to their strong aversion um, to taking risks and, that, and being linked to financial distress. This is a common, uh, explained quite well in the family business literature. Now, their attitude towards debt financing uh, of, that prevails with the, with the family businesses to some degree is influenced by their beliefs and values of the previous generation. And financial capital has been allocated to maintaining the welfare of family and community. And you're going to see this aspect of family and community coming through a lot um, in um, the, unpacking the findings. Now, the underlying theory of the study, uh, which was used, to, the lens in which the study was viewed through, was Hofstede's, Hofstede's cultural dimensions, uh, cultural dimensions the theory. Um, at the end of this presentation, I will highlight on how a lot more on how these uh, Hofstede can help us understand some of the results that we've seen. Um, but the findings from financial capital specifically link quite well with. Hofstede's cultural dimension for uncertainty avoidance um, that was seen for the Southern African region. So what is it that we can then take away or what can businesses, African, indigenous African family businesses take note of when it comes to adopting um, financial capital or financing practices? Well, the successful ones we found use debt capital. Um, they keep it to a minimum. They are risk averse in selecting sources of capital. Um, their beliefs and values are from the founding generations Gener uh, founding generation, generation's uh, influence, and capital is allocated to maintaining the welfare of the family and the community. So those who've been successful, these are, these are the key things that they've adopted when it comes to the financing side. The second aspect of the resource pools that uh, we found interesting results was in terms of the leadership. Now, all three CEOs, of course, are leaders in their, business, in their family businesses, and they have the authority and freedom to lead by example without unwanted interference from the founding fathers. That's very important, that they were all given the freedom to themselves within the business and put their own footprint and not have this founding CEO uh, sitting over their shoulder. Now, in their leadership styles, they can be best described as participative, particip participative, sorry. And this means that they involve others they take into account the feelings of uh, the people who they're making decisions with and generally look for consensus when it comes to making major decisions. They, uh, and they always lead by example. They empower others as well uh, within the business and encourage them to participate in the decision-making process. So there's a very participative consensus finding um, culture that's created when it comes to leadership. Now, these findings contradict a lot of the general family business literature, which talks about family business owners being more autocratic and directive in their style. The businesses who participated in this study, who have been successful in terms of getting to the second generation, all showed a more participative style. When looking at that leadership style from the African perspective, um, they also displayed what, would be, what can be described as paternalistic leadership style. Now, in Western literature, when you talk about paternalistic uh, leadership style, this is often closely associated with that autocratic leadership style. Um, but in the African context, and it has an, it's seen with a negative context, uh, connotations to it. But in the African context, paterni paternalistic leadership refers to a leader who is involved in the lives of his or her subordinates um, and is as, part of, as they're part of their role as a carer and a protector. So that participative, um, paternalistic leadership style is seen as a positive in the African context and not necessarily a negative as it would be in your Western literature. Um, the leadership style by all the CEOs had been influenced by the founders. All three had been mentored by the founders and have adopted their values and principles that were passed down. And again, this is supported by literature in the African context, which talks about um, Africans having a deep respect for, we have a deep respect for our elders and a desire to maintain norms and values that have been established by our elders. So this was quite evident when it came to the leadership style of uh, the participants of the study. 
again, if we go back to Hofstede's uh, cultural dimensions, uh, this, is, this ties in very well with the long-term orientation seen by, um, the, as the cultural dimension uh, when it comes to the Southern African region. And what can we then learn or best practices that we can take note of following these leadership practices that can be adopted? First of all, leadership is participative. It empowers and encourages uh, individuals within the business to participate in the decision-making process. It's evident that the paternalistic leadership style uh, is more of a fatherly benevolence than an autocratic style of leadership and is linked to concern and well-being for the subordinates. That's, that was very emphasized by, uh, seen quite a lot in the unpacking of the research. And the norms and values of the elders and religious beliefs tend to influence the leadership style adopted. Looking closely at their decision-making, which is linked to your leadership style, again, if you, you've got participative uh, leadership style, when it comes to your decision-making, decisions are always made when it comes to consultation, which is, you see, it's linked to that leadership style. And a necessary uh, consultation with outside experts. So uh, again, with this consultation, we're seeking consensus and buy-in of everybody. And uh, this, seemed, this emerged as very important when it came to the strategic decision-making processes. Uh, operational decisions tend to be uh, delegated by the managers, uh, delegated to the managers, but your strategic ma management decisions, um, the close network of family leaders come up to these, would make these decisions after consensus and buy-in. So given these findings about consensus and buy-in, um, we learn the practices adopted by these successful businesses. First of all, decision-making authority is influenced by the position on family levels. Consensus and collaborative decision-making uh, must take place. Strategic management, strategic decisions uh, take uh, consultation and buy-in from everybody. Operational decisions, on the other hand, are delegated to the managers who are empowered to make those decisions. And the culture of Ubuntu and the benevolent leadership, paternalistic leadership style influence the nature of these decisions made. Next resource pool that we want to look at where there was some interesting findings when it comes to governance. Now, all three businesses did not have formal governance structures in place, which ties into, uh, as I said in the introduction, that the majority of our family businesses tend to be less formal or institutionalized. Um, they all highlighted the fact that they have good communication between the family members, as well as the high costs of setting up formal structures as reasons why they didn't have these structures in place. Um, furthermore, the lack of governance uh, could also be explained by the roles uh, being known and accepted in the family culture, African culture. The fact that we know the leaders who are seen as leaders and they don't need to necessarily be documented as such in an official structure. Uh, when it comes from your, the norms and cultures of your African heritage as well, where leadership is just implied and the decision making is an uh, authority comes from the family structure as well as not just the business structure. Now, although no formal governance structures existed, all the businesses had some form of decision-making, informal decision-making teams, which acted as a governance structure. And these teams consisted of the CEO, a senior family member from the previous generation, and either the CEO's wife or else an outsider. And these teams functioned in a similar manner to what, would, what we understand as a advisory board or a traditional advisory board. Now, the role of these senior members, um, the wife and other members, uh, is, was clearly highlighted in these discussions with these businesses and uh, they operated as almost a, a board of advisors or a board of trustees but not formally so that's why we highlight that it was still informal that's why we don't they, we say they don't have formal structures in place now the inclusion of a senior generation in these teams is very typical again in the African context when you talk about the elder generation um, tending to take a more respected uh, respected elder who provides that knowledge, guidance, and wisdom, the position of a respected elder. So in all the businesses, that senior person who has now stepped away from the business has now taken a more advisory role um, 
to give their, pass down their knowledge, guidance, and wisdom. Now, given these findings, what can, we, what can we learn from what these businesses have adopted in terms of their governance practices? Effective governance structures exist in the form of informal decision-making teams, similar to what would be your traditional advisory boards. Governance is dependent on key knowledgeable individuals and not necessarily on formal structures. So the people are more important than the structures currently. Um, effective communication and family roles dictated by African culture often fulfill those roles when it comes to your governance structures. And respected elders pay, play a key role when it comes to uh, family governance. The next point of uh, where there were some interesting findings comes around the organizational culture of a family or family, indigenous African family business. Now, the values and organizational culture existing in these business under investigation, they stem from the founders and have been continued or perpetuated by the second generation CEOs. And this further cements again that the concept of uh, that deep rooted respect for elders and desire to maintain your norms and values established by the previous generation. Uh, furthermore, the values of hard work, honesty, and respect, and empathy for others, both inside and outside the business, are held in very high regard. And this is in line with the African philosophy of Ubuntu, you know, the I am because you are. And all three businesses placed a very strong emphasis on social responsibility. And this came through as well when you talked about um, their result, uh, their performance uh, non-financial performance needs or non-financial performance outcomes. The emphasis on social responsibility came through very strongly. It was also evident that the culture within the business was heavily interest, uh, influenced by the beliefs, religious beliefs of the family. And the, these family, business, the family businesses highlighted that members working within the business tended to display a sense of entitlement. Now this sense of entitlement, when we unpack it, goes by various terms depending on um, the context in which you operate in. And we found that uh, in some places we call it a black tax, some places we call it a social responsibility tax. And this is because your successful African family businesses often tend to carry that unspoken responsibility to support family and extended family members. And the responsibility to provide for them tends to form, uh, fall disproportionately on members who take economic initiative, which then leads to this family and extended family members feeling entitled to the proceeds of the business and feeling like they're owed something by the family business. So businesses which have been, they've been able to successfully manage this uh, um, culture or sentiment of entitlement or um, we can call it a social responsibility tax towards the family. Uh, they've been the ones who managed to now navigate to the next generation. So um, given our findings, what can we take note of? Uh, hard work, honesty, integrity, and respect, empathy for others, very important uh, when it comes to the culture you're trying to establish within the business. Religion played an important role, influencing the underlying attitudes towards work and laws and responsibility for one's behavior, which is very important again, when it comes to um, how the business wants to be seen. A strong emphasis was placed on uh, responsibility in particular, looking at uh, giving back to the community that was encouraged and even budgeted for in the finances of the business. And a family orientation exists within the business where plans are actually made around providing monetary support for family and extended family members. So instead of ignoring the fact that, uh, or seeing it as a problem, the fact that uh, family members, both close and extended, ex are expecting um, something from uh, the family business active family business members. This is actually planned for and budgeted for within the businesses. And those businesses who did that tended to be more successful. So that deals with the key things that came out from the resource pools. I want to highlight a couple of the key things from the entrepreneurial orientation side. In other words, how entrepreneurial are these businesses? In yesterday's presentation, uh, Professor Fenter highlighted the fact that innovativeness in the African, indigenous African business context is not necessarily the same as what we would uh, say when we talk about innovation in general in the Western context. So if I can highlight a couple of the entrepreneurial orientation aspects that were seen. Innovativeness in, was seen in the, two, in the businesses in two distinct scenarios, namely as they were responding to the challenges and threats in the macro business environment 
and as they're engaging in expansion, expansion activities. So this suggests that innovative behavior is very key when it comes to responding to changes and challenges that arise in the external environment, as well as ensuring that, ensuring that the business grows. And this is very important as well, given the fact that the, the business environment in which these uh, businesses operate in the African context is very, very uh, turbulent and requires a lot of innovative behavior in, in response to the challenges that each of these businesses face in their different countries. Furthermore, it was found that uh, innovation activities undertaken by the businesses relate to enhancements on existing processes and not technological innovation as we, as we would think of in, innovation. Uh, this was evident both in the South African and Botswana businesses where large sums of money had been invested in upgrading existing infrastructure and systems. And in the Zimbabwe family business, large sums of money had been invested in human resources when it came to expanding their operations into um, outside markets. In this case, they, up, they expanded into the Botswana market. So innovation seen as key when it comes to responding to challenges in the external environment. And it's not necessarily technological but more a case of uh, enhancing existing processes that are in place. Uh, this was as a result possibly because of the industries in which they operate in, which don't have much room necessarily for uh, technological advancement, but also within the context they operate in, technological advancements take on a lot of uh, financial costs and uh, a lot of uh, have a lot of financial implications. And these businesses don't necessarily want to sink such large sums of money into technological advancements as we would know them when it comes to innovativeness. So they tend to be more innovative in their processes. So what are the key things that we can learn from their innovative practices? It's not based on, first of all, innovation is not based on uh, product innovation, but rather on incremental innovation and directed at expansion activities and addressing uh, threats from the business environment. In order to address those threats, it's important that these, uh, these businesses show that they continuously scan the environment to identify future expansion opportunities and anticipate potential, potential threats. You think of your SWOT analysis or your PSD analysis. Uh, the nature of the industry in which these businesses operate also influences the degree of technological innovation that takes place. So the, the industries in which these businesses operated, namely your construction, and uh, fuel retail businesses, there's not much room for technological advancement, but there is still room for your incremental uh, innovation. And lastly, a learning orientation is embraced where owners and managers are continuously striving to educate and upskill themselves and their employees so as to be equipped to come up with these innovative ideas. So innovation in, in the indigenous African context, more on the processes rather than the product innovation side. The other interesting finding from the uh, entrepreneurial orientation side, how entrepreneurial the business is, we found that Af the African family businesses should take note of the following. First of all, combative encounters with other businesses should be avoided and rather placed uh, on internal, more emphasis on internal strategies to outperform the competition. Um, emphasis also placed on building and maintaining good, a good business reputation and good re uh, relationships with your competitors. So where in your, in your successful Western businesses, competitive aggressiveness is uh, seen as the norm and often in, and encouraged, uh, almost your zero-sum game. Uh, competition amongst competitors wasn't seen as uh, ideal when it came to these businesses and their success. They rather compete on other areas as opposed to uh, directly uh, being competitively aggressive towards their, com their competition. So they prefer to rather have maintain good relationships, a good reputation, uh, which ties in a lot with that uh, image and social responsibility. And if you look at uh, maintaining good relationships with the competitors was much more important to them than behaving competitively aggressively to them. Okay, so given that, we talk about entrepreneurial orientation, we talk about incremental innovativeness, uh, proactiveness, moderate risk taking, the businesses of that risk averse we mentioned earlier, uh, limited competitive aggressiveness. So those, that competitive aggressiveness is kept towards uh, other strategies rather than direct competition and autonomy in terms of allowing uh, businesses, 
allowing people within the business to function autonomously and come up with ideas on how to progress the business. The last aspect I want to look at is your entrepreneurial outcomes, your, your, sorry, your family business performance outcomes, which can be divided into three. You have your entrepreneurial outcomes, which then link to your financial performance outcomes, which then tie into your social performance outcomes. And if you achieve those three, the business transgenerational potential is hopefully likely within the business. Now, what are the things we take note of from research when it comes to looking at the family business performance outcomes? First of all, uh, performance outcomes are multidimensional in nature, as we said. We're looking at financial, social, and entrepreneurial outcomes. Now, key financial outcomes include growth in profit and turnover and maintaining a positive cash flow, as has uh, as is standard uh, when it comes to looking at performance. But the industry as well in which the business operates determines the order of importance given those financial performance outcomes. Also noteworthy performance uh, outcomes include expanding into new geographic markets and altering existing business models. So um, to give you an example, the, the Zimbabwe family business that was interviewed, the Zimbabwean family business, in Zimbabwe, they, their business is more on the construction side of things, and their clients are more your institutional clients. When they expanded into new markets, into Botswana, they moved more to the services side of the business, and their clientele was more your individual consumers. So that's altering your business models to, um, and helping when it comes to expansion activities. A strong emphasis is placed on, the, placed on achieving social performance outcomes. All three businesses who participated in the study emphasized the fact that your social outcomes were very important, almost um, uh, as imp more important than the financial outcomes. The financial outcomes were there to support a lot of their social outcomes, which ties in very well with uh, your social emotional wealth theory that uh, was spoken about yesterday. Now, your social performance outcomes are aligned with the value system of the family and most notably the operations of the business are conducted with the community at heart. So the business is seen as part of the community and therefore it's not seen as successful until it can contribute positively to that community. So some of the important uh, performance outcomes uh, include serving the community, maintaining a good reputation, passing on the business to the next generation. And if you can achieve those uh, three multidimensional uh, performance outcomes, that's what will lead you on to transgenerational uh, success. If I can talk about the three bubbles, four bubbles here, uh, Ubuntu, collectivist culture, community, and extended family commitments. These are all your contextual factors that influence the business and how they operate. Ubuntu was seen as throughout all its activity, the business, all the business's activities in their decision-making processes, in their leadership style, in uh, their social performance outcomes. Ubuntu was seen uh, coming through an important uh, uh, issue that businesses need to take into account. Being one of the community, the businesses seeing themselves as part of the community and therefore tying their success to the community was a very uh, integral part to their success. And then managing your extended family commitments. I talk about extended family commitments or some people refer to it as your black tax, some people refer to it as your... Uh, your social, social responsibility towards your family and extended family. These businesses all made provisions for that and uh, in their budgeting, in their financing, in their strategies, and as one of some of their performance outcomes. And this was very important when it came to them being successful. If I can touch on the underlying theory of uh, that the lens in which the uh, research was viewed through, Hofstede's cultural dimensions. Hofstede's cultural dimensions made up of Six dimensions, we're looking at your power distance theory, looking at individualism versus collectivism, masculinity versus femininity, uncertainty avoidance, long-term, short-term, and indulgence versus restraint. Now, research has been done in uh, some uh, around the world, but not in all Southern African countries. So in order to make comparisons to see, uh, we had to find where data was actually available. And what you'll find is that uh, you'll find that there was common things seen amongst all uh, these, the countries selected where there was data, in, uh, in this case, Malawi, Namibia, South Africa, and Zambia, all part of the Southern African region, hence their selection. And except for a couple of places where South Africa 
had some outliers that was mainly due to the fact that the sample wasn't 100% indigenous. You'll find that there's common trends when it comes to power distance, individualism versus collectivism. You can see that collectivism is a very uh, clearly stands out. Uh, masculinity versus femininity, uh, uncertainty avoidance. We said that those businesses tend to be risk averse. That was common amongst the culture that was observed. We tend to have a long-term versus short-term orientation and uh, tend to not focus on indulgence. Okay, that is my presentation for today. I will, I try to pack everything in. There's a lot to unpack in the framework, um, but I tried to touch on the aspects which specifically link to your indigenous African family businesses that were of interest. And then I'll leave the floor open now for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Tony, for that very interesting um, research paper. And um, just listening to all this, I had a lot of things that I could relate to as a family business owner myself. So I'm going to open up the floor to anybody who may have questions for Dr. Tony. Please go to your chat box and type in those questions or in your question and answer box. And uh, we will give those um, questions through to Tony. There is a question here from um, Elmarie that, that we'll kick off the session with, which is, does indigenous have a different meaning for different countries in Africa? And is there a difference in innovation, for example, when comparing Western family businesses with indigenous African family businesses? Thank you very much, Nikkei. Um, if I can tackle the indigenous African question first. Um, in doing this research, that was one of the challenges initially, that can we actually define what is indigenous African uh, in the, to, to clarify for our study? And what I found was that in the three countries that we did uh, use in terms of the study, in Zimbabwe, an indigenous African is actually defined, defined in the indigenous Indigenization and Economic Empowerment Act as any person who before Zimbabwe's independence in 1980 uh, was disadvantaged by unfair discrimination on the grounds of race and any descendant of such a person is considered an indigenous African in the Zimbabwe context. And we give all the tribes that are associated with that. Uh, in Botswana, an indigenous African is defined as a citizen of Botswana who is Botswana, Alanga, Ye, Mbukushu, Sibai, Herero, uh, Twampong, Kalanga, Birwa, whole, and they list and they actually list all the different uh, sub-tribes uh, that are found in Botswana, indigenous to Botswana. In South Africa, the term indigenous African is used to refer to the majority black African population. Um, those are the definitions when it came to indigenous, when we were trying to now say what differentiate between uh, your indigenous African versus just your African family business. Um, so there are, there is, every country does have in, in some way or form a definition for indigenous African that is slightly different in that country's particular context. Um, the next question you spoke about was about uh, innovation. Definitely there are differences seen in uh, the innovation and the aspects of innovation when it comes to the Western concept versus innovation in the African, indigenous African context. Innovation generally is seen as, as, I, as I said in my presentation, an activity that is heavily capital intensive uh, requires a lot of finance and is looking, you're looking more at your technological innovation. That is what is assumed when you're talking about innovation in, um, in general, if you look at the literature on innovation. When we look at the innovation in these businesses who were successful, um, they didn't necessarily fit your traditional definition of being innovative. They were innovative more in their practices. Um, they were, they practice more as what would define as incremental innovation um, because obviously they're not in uh, putting such large sums of money towards technological innovation. And as I said, that can be influenced by your uh, level of income, can also be, it's also influenced by the industry you operate in, as well as the business environment in which the business finds itself. So definitely there are differences in innovation. And that's a very good question from Prof. Fenter there. Excellent. Um, we have a question in the chat box from Salish. Excellent research, Dr. Tony. Did you find that the women in these family businesses are being developed for leadership roles? Yes, that was, uh, I, I, 
I realized I didn't expand a lot on that part. Um, the role of women came through very heavily in those three businesses. Those three business, all three businesses went against the grain when it came to the traditional role of women in the African culture, actually. The women in those businesses were empowered. They were seen as the glue within the family. And if we, I spoke about the informal uh, governance teams that were set up, those were uh, the elders, the, the elder generation and the uh, female gen, females within the business and within the family played an important role in those uh, uh, governance teams in terms of, in terms of uh, guiding leadership, in terms of giving, uh, overseeing issues and uh, disputes, making sure that uh, there's unity within the business. So definitely that, that did come through. And in a couple of the businesses as well, the, the daughter rather than the son was seen as the next generation person identified to take over in the family business, which is quite unique, I think. And uh, I think something that these businesses highlight the fact that we're looking past the firstborn son getting everything and rather looking at who is the most appropriate person to take over and who has an interest and who has the skills and the know-how to do so. So definitely the role of women did come through strongly in the research. Then we have another question where it's um, addressing the lack of formal governance structures. Do you think as the family business transitions beyond generation two to generation three, there will be a need to formalize the governance when the founding generation will no longer be around? Yes, um, I do believe that as the business goes from generation to generation, it's going to expand. It's going to become more complex in terms of the number of family members involved and the generations of family members involved and the streams of family. And therefore, there will be a need to have more formalized governance structures. Um, one, of, one of my conclusions from the research was that although these businesses did not have formal governance structures in place, that doesn't necessarily mean that they should ignore the fact that they should. And that could actually be something that they would help improve their chances of going now from the second to the third generation. As the business becomes more complex, the family relationships become more complex, and uh, it will also help, help to have uh, formal structures in place to guide that next generation to be able to follow what, the, the, what was already knowledge the first and third generation that might now not need to be passed down. Having it somewhere formally written down and having structures in place to, that, to run the business will definitely help when it comes to getting to the third and fourth generations, I'm sure. We have a question from Dr. Pierre. The charts show a high level of individual, individualism in South Africa and a high level of masculinity, male dominated. How do you see the gender issues in African indigenous family firms? Um, well, in the African culture in general, we tend to be more on the paternalistic than the maternalistic side. So definitely that masculinity does come through. However, these businesses which are successful, like I said, they, um, they tended to be more collectivist than individualist. And they tended to as well exhibit more feminine, what would be feminine characteristics in uh, uh, cultural dimensions theory more so than the masculine characteristics and I think that's a key ingredient of those businesses success and being able to navigate all the challenges you face going through um, from one generation to the next so in terms of navigating ge uh, gender uh, gender issues that's still that's something that uh, needs to be addressed it's a societal thing it's a cultural thing but um, I think each family each business needs to have a look at their particular situation in terms of um, gender roles and uh, masculinity versus femininity and asking, asking themselves um, the role of women within their businesses, within the families, uh, that it's not restricted to what was your traditional role of women. I think that's very important going forward. Then we have a question from Ahmed and he's asking, in your research, was there a minute book or file to refer to the, to the family's decisions taken? A minute book or file? To refer uh, to the family decisions taken. A minute book or file? Okay, the, the businesses uh, 
a lot of the, the strategic decisions that were taken were, as I said, there was a lot of meetings and consensus and uh, discussion that happened before those were taken and those were documented. You have records of those. Your operational decisions that were taken by the managers tended to, as I said, they were empowered to make decisions on the day-to-day -day and uh, getting record of those uh, would be a bit difficult because they're making decisions on the fly. Um, what we did find, find though was that in, what I found though in interviewing these uh, managers and the CEOs and the family members involved was that uh, you found common trends around all, around all of them in terms of the decisions that were taken and the reasons behind it and the philosophies applied to those decisions made. So I wouldn't say there's a, necessarily a, a book or a, uh, a roll call of it, but definitely there was notes taken when it came to your big strategic management decisions for the business. So those which had especially a big financial impact on the business. And we have one question from Jacob. With the transgenerational gaps in business, do you think that the founding fathers still have a key role going forward as new business models are adopted or required? Yes, I do. I think that definitely you can have no substitute for experience. So we can, the, the founding generation will always have a role to play in terms of their knowledge and experience and wisdom. But uh, as, as was seen with the, the businesses in my study, those founding uh, fathers also took a step back and allowed the second generation to be able to come put their own imprint on the business and uh, be able to also come up with their own ideas and see their own solutions when it comes to solving problems and uh, how the business should run. But the, definitely the founding generation must still be there for guidance, for uh, wisdom, for uh, that that role as an elder and that came through that's a gen, uh, generally in your african culture literature we talk about the role of elders that will always be there that's never going to disappear um, it's just a case of uh, finding that balance between having an advisor someone with wisdom who you can bounce ideas off versus someone who's still forcing an old way of doing things to a new problem that has arised so they, there will always be that need for that experienced person but there must be a balance Brilliant. Um, then there is a question from Guy, and he's saying, many thanks. There, has there been any similar researches covering two samples, Indigenous family and then non-Indigenous family? Would it be relevant? It would be relevant to see the differences and similarities. Well done. Um, that's a very good point. And I know my, col my colleagues, uh, Professor Fent and Professor uh, Farrington, are very busy with other cases and comparative studies we definitely in the future we will be able to compare and contrast as we build up our database of knowledge and database of cases of both indigenous and uh, your non-indigenous African businesses. I think that is a study for the future for sure. Maybe that person can consider coming to talk to us and we can partner with them. Thank you so much, Dr. Tony. That's been an excellent session. I'll just read out a comment in the chat box as we close from Beverly Gray. Outstanding research, Tony, and well done. Interesting and important research to explore further and elsewhere in Africa. There is so much we have to learn. Well done and an excellent presentation. I'm enjoying this conference and every speaker so far. Thank you all. And on that note, it was a really excellent presentation and a great insight into Afrocentric family businesses and um, giving us that understanding of the benevolent paternalistic leadership style and the cultural considerations it's been really interesting so thank you so much um, we've got our next session in 10 minutes so um, we'll be rounding up now and please log back on for the next session at um, 12 p.m central african time harari johannesburg time thank you everyone thank you thank you very much